Uh, hello, how do you do? My name is Ian Garcia, and this is the first in what I'm hoping will turn out to be a longer-running series of video essays critiquing film that I'm tentatively titling Devotional Criticism. For this first video, I'd like to talk about a documentary I watched quite recently within the last month called Without Memory. Without Memory is a Japanese TV documentary originally broadcast in December 1996, produced and directed by Hirokazu Koreeda. Now, some of you might be familiar with Koreeda as a director of fiction films. Over the course of his career, he's garnered a reputation of nearly universal acclaim among international film critics. You might be familiar with two of his more recent films of the last seven years, such as After the Storm in 2016 and Shoplifters in 2018. And he's also got a new movie out in the U.S. this year called Broker. But before transitioning into fiction film in the mid-90s, Correa got his start making television documentaries, and Without Memory is just one of them. The subject of Without Memory is a married father of two and a social worker named Hiroshi Sekine. Hiroshi, due to a medical malpractice following surgery he underwent two years prior to the documentary's filming, now suffers from the inability to form memories. Now, to be clear, Hiroshi does not suffer from amnesia. He has not lost memories from before his surgery. He recognizes who he is, who his family and friends are, etc. Rather, Hiroshi's specific disability is the severe impairment of his ability to store and recall episodic memory, or the memory of discrete events. Even when it comes to tasks as routine as going grocery shopping with his children, for instance, and within a very short time of having performed these tasks, Hiroshi will have no recollection of these events having occurred. Koreeda's documentary is largely devoted to the exploration and the evolution in our understanding of Hiroshi's disability, and how it affects his and his family's attempts to live a dignified life. Every day, Hiroshi wakes up unable to remember all of the intervening events between his surgery and the present, and his wife Miwa has to remind him multiple times per day of his condition. Hiroshi will write copious notes to himself in order to remind himself of basic tasks he has yet to perform or has already performed so that he doesn't do them again, and then even notes to remind him about his notes. He keeps journals so that he can record his thoughts and emotions, but the dominant recursive picture that forms from these journals is of a man whose everyday life, because he cannot form memories, becomes something like an unending dream. Like in a dream, there is no continuity between events as Hiroshi experiences them. They are only impressions that are at once familiar to him, but also disconcertingly alienating, with the changing world around him constantly conflicting with those memories that remain. Though he knows who he is, the disjuncture between Hiroshi's impaired conception of himself and the accelerating pace of both his personal life and the world around him means that his emotional experience will always be dominated by anxiety, uncertainty, and frustration. A man without memory, Correa's narration suggests, is a man who can never really have any security in the knowledge of who he is because he is no longer an individual who exists through time, but is rather always arrested in an eternally recurring and false sense of what is the present. But as Correa and his film crew continue to document Hiroshi's life, one of the most fascinating components of Without Memory becomes the discovery of how, while Hiroshi is incapable of storing and recalling episodic memory, he is nonetheless still capable of retaining small impressions of people and places because of his emotional memory.
in the aforementioned instance of Hiroshi and his son going to the supermarket, for instance, while he cannot recall performing the errand in its general entirety, he still remembers seeing his son carrying a produce basket that is too heavy for him and becoming concerned that he's going to hurt himself. As another example, though he doesn't remember from day to day why Koreeda and his film crew are at his house, because he cannot remember each and every time that they have come to visit him, he is remarkably able to connect names to their faces. あ、覚えてるかもね。前は本当なんかわかりません。これだそうなんですね。だから。池さん。はい。おばさん。じゃないです。おばというものも来たことない。あ、そうですか。おばさんは女性ですか?はい。おばさん。あ、本田さん。は
Another is the obligations that societies have towards the disabled or differently abled, whichever term you think best applies into a particular case or to yourself if you happen to be a disabled or differently abled person who's listening or watching this. Uh, particularly in the context where policies of socioeconomic austerity, such as Japan was going through at the time that uh, Koreeda began making this documentary, result in unintended consequences that not only make life harder for the disabled and differently abled, but also, in Hiroshi's case, are indirectly related to the origins of his impairment. And I'm not going to give away uh, how that is related. I'll leave it up to you as an audience to seek out without memory for yourself, because I think you will enjoy experiencing the narrative on your own. But for the purposes of this video essay, it's really the quality of Hiroshi's inability to store and recall events from his immediate past, but nonetheless his ability to retain a kind of emotional memory that I find very deeply fascinating. Now, this is not going to be an essay on the science of the mind or neurology. I'm just not in a position of expertise where I feel confident commenting on those things. I do, however, feel relatively confident in terms of my ability to analyze without memory and to use it as a kind of speculative case study in order to ask questions and make proposals concerning ethics when it comes to documentary filmmaking. To be clear, this is not my attempt to criticize without memory in terms of my accusing Koreeda and his production team of engaging in unethical practices. This is not a negative critique at all, but rather a more generalized critique of documentary as a genre of storytelling that I find quite personally edifying and that I hope will be edifying for whoever happens to be watching or listening to this. This perhaps goes without saying, but we might as well just get it out of the way. It is very important, if we wish to live in a society in which people are active and engaged in their media literacy, that we not take it for granted that when we are watching a documentary that we are receiving objective information. Obviously, any documentary, just like any piece of journalism or even any fiction film attempting to dramatize something that is in some sense related to an understanding of a real event or reality in general, like all of these things, a documentary is going to be informed by the unique perspective and the biases of the creator. So, in the case of Without Memory, Koreeda does not merely suggest that Hiroshi's condition is the result of a one-off case of medical malpractice. Without being too explicit about his own political perspectives, the narrative that he constructs in Without Memory is relatively clear in terms of its critique of how changes in legislation, particularly as they attempt to promote governmental austerity and less dependence upon the state for medical interventions, indirectly leads to suffering, with the Sakine family being just one example of a broader social phenomenon. A lot of Koreeda's documentaries are uh, his earlier stuff is like this, interrogating the effects of Japanese political austerity in the 80s and the late 90s on the broader quality of life for not just individuals, but society in general. At the same time, in exploring the Sakine family's struggle to collect disability payments from the government, obviously Miwa bears the primary burden of taking care of the family and Hiroshi is unable to maintain stable employment, Without Memory also reflects Koreeda's criticism of the Japanese welfare state's bureaucracy. So those are a couple of biases and individual political perspectives right there that are going to very much determine and influence the way a narrative and factual aspects of a story are presented to us. But let's even take questions of politics out of the equation and simply tackle material concerns about how all film and television, whether fiction or documentary, 
is necessarily subject to the creative intervention and manipulation of the people producing it. For instance, merely beginning the process of producing a documentary requires that you investigate a topic and, in many cases, select specific individuals who you consult, interview, or observe as part of the bare minimum process of assembling footage that you will then attempt to compose into a coherent narrative. And merely that first stage of intervention, if we presume that documentaries have some unique obligation of presenting this narrative in a manner that is truthful and accurate, even that first intervention can open us up to some really troubling questions, such as, how do we know that an interview subject is presenting themselves, their views, or their positions honestly? Or, how do we know that the subject being observed by the documentarian is acting in such a way that they would otherwise, even if they weren't conscious of being filmed? On the other end of that relationship, how do we know that the filmmaker is presenting the subject or their role in a recorded event in a way that is truthful or accurate? Furthermore, how does the process of setting up these interviews and events actually work, especially if the documentary is being recorded over an extended period of time? How does the evolving relationship and rapport between the subject and the filmmaker inform the potentially biased or inaccurate presentation of people and events? At the end of the day, these are not only questions we need to start asking about documentary filmmaking from a supposed position of ethical rigor or purity. To a certain extent, we are behooved to ask these questions precisely because of the broader material limitations placed on a documentary production. Like all forms of media, documentaries require time, resources, and money to make, and none of these requirements are infinite. Often, documentaries will do a substantial amount of research before a single bit of original footage is even shot, and the narrative objective of the documentary is largely pinned down and determined ahead of time. But even in cases where documentarians take a more hands-off approach, throwing themselves into a situation or a subject and gradually discovering what they think the story will be, very few individuals have the time, the resources, or the financial backing to extend a production for longer than a couple of years at the most. At some point, you often need to make creative interventions that are not in the strictest sense as truthful, accurate, or authentic as they could be because your hands are tied by material concerns. You only have so much time, so many resources at your disposal, and so much money. At that point, questions of ethics need to find some sort of compromise with questions of material necessity, as well as artistic creativity. So the questions when it comes to documentaries are no longer simply matters of whether or not the narrative presentation of information is truthful, accurate, or as authentic as possible, but rather how creative interventions can be made to both satisfy the material necessities of documentary filmmaking while also complementing a truthful, accurate, or authentic presentation. These sorts of necessary creative interventions can be relatively minor or quite elaborate depending upon the subject, the limitations of the production, and the nature of the documentary director's unique creative vision. At one end of the spectrum, merely selecting a location, setting up a camera, and doing a simple talking head interview with one person subject constitutes a creative intervention. It would not happen if the documentary wasn't being produced. On the other end of the spectrum, though, some of the most revered luminaries of the modern documentary, such as Werner Herzog and Errol Morris, have been known to sometimes work very intimately with their subjects, not only to coach them to express their ideas or their perspectives and beliefs as simply and directly as possible, but also to stage scenes in order to ostensibly convey some more complex or abstract quality of the subject's character, their experiences, and even their relationship with the documentarian themselves 
in a way that would not be possible if we adhered to only the most rigid, puritanist notions of journalistic objectivity. Some documentaries hardly rely on any so-called factual materials at all, but are rather composed almost exclusively of stylized dramatizations. And in all of these cases, one could argue it is precisely the willingness of a documentarian, not as a mere presenter of facts, but as an artist and a storyteller, to intervene creatively that we can actually uncover truths that are not otherwise accessible because reality itself, so-called, is also composed by its very nature of absences, deceptions, and untruths. Now, this is all very well and good from the perspective of the documentarian, and I'll be frank about my own bias, which is that I tend to be far more sympathetic to this philosophy of creative intervention for the sake of artistic truth. But there's always a tension between what satisfies a presentiment of the truth and our own, as an audience, lingering sense of anxiety, frustration, and uncertainty about what the truth really is. The documentarian has a lot of privilege when it comes to weaving an ostensibly truthful or accurate narrative that nonetheless requires immediate and extensive creative intervention, and while they may exploit this privilege in the name of a higher aspiration of truth beyond what is merely factual, they could just as easily be exploiting it for their own cynical purposes or to pander to a preconception that the audience already has, either by catering to a very biased perspective or, more generally, simply trying to tell the most entertaining and not necessarily the most informative or edifying story. It is we as spectators who ultimately shoulder the inordinate burden of maintaining a consciousness about the artistic, material, and ethical dilemmas that are endemic to the production of the media we consume, and attempting, as best we can, to ask questions, not even necessarily so that we can come to any definitive conclusions, but simply because asking these questions alone helps us to maintain our own necessary ethical distance from the documentary as a commodity, as an escapist spectacle, or in the worst case scenario, as merely propaganda. Now, to be clear, again, I am not terribly concerned about without memory in particular. This is not going to be something where I'm finally going to drop the shoe and reveal some unconscionable breach of ethics that in which Corrieta engaged in order to tell the story he wanted to tell. My point is only that even the asking of very basic and simple questions is important from a critical and ethical standpoint. And it is not only important from the standpoint of maintaining our critical and ethical distance from the documentary, but it is also important for quite the opposite reason, in that these very basic, simple questions can actually help us to all the more, all the better appreciate the artistic craft that goes into making a good documentary, which is not merely a didactic presentation of facts, but a form of storytelling that combines factuality with creative intervention. And I think Without Memory is a very good documentary, but it is also, in its way, at least intuitively, a rather basic, simple documentary produced for television that has a rather narrow objective to cater to the average TV audience's desire to be educated about the world around them, but in a way that is subtly entertaining. And in this capacity, I think that Without Memory serves as a fantastic, basic, simple case study for asking precisely the kinds of basic, simple questions that I think are essential to a society of active media literacy and appreciation of the popular arts. There is one sequence from Without Memory in particular I want to discuss, which relates to the fact that while Hiroshi Sakine lacks the capacity to store and recall episodic memory, he nonetheless maintains an enigmatic degree of emotional memory. The sequence occurs just over an hour into the documentary, and the only piece of background you need for it is that, while Hiroshi does not have stable employment because of his disability, with the encouragement of his wife, Miwa, Hiroshi begins volunteering at a home for the disabled. 
The sequence begins with Hiroshi arriving at the home, unable to remember his relationships with anyone there, but nonetheless drawing upon his lingering semantic and task memory from when he previously used to be a career social worker, committing himself to this opportunity to help others. Among his tasks is assisting two of the home's staff in performing massage and hypertension therapy on three individuals with severe mental and muscular disabilities, which involves singing the following song to console them. This sequence is one of the few in the entire documentary in which we see Hiroshi in a state where he seems unambiguously contented and fulfilled. At the end of the day, one of the staff, just as he has done week after week working with Hiroshi as a volunteer, invites Hiroshi to return again next week, and the surprised and humble Hiroshi accepts because each and every time he does not remember that each and every time he's being he's been asked to return. Hiroshi returns home, but by the following week, having no memory of what he did the week before, he finds himself apprehensive and conflicted about returning to the home. Considering only Hiroshi's routine emotional burden, Corieta leaves us with no closure as to whether or not he returned to the home and felt the same sense of use, contentment, and fulfillment. We don't get a closure or a sense that he's continuing on consistently with this thing that gives him a sense of purpose. He does, however, end the sequence with this excerpt from Hiroshi's journal, which turns out to be a testament to the power of his emotional memory, the his ability to store bits of semantic information based on the deep emotional impressions they leave on him, despite not literally being able to remember anything general about why he has that memory or why he recalls it. When I learned today was Tuesday, I became anxious. I panicked. I can't remember anything about last night, but that QQQ song comes to me. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Well, let's just ask some basic questions. Basic, simple questions. Remember, a documentary is a narrative, not necessarily a straightforward presentation of information. It involves artistic interventions, whether at the level of planning, production, or, in the case that I would like to talk about, post-production. In this case, the editing of the available footage at Corieta's disposal to tell a story. So, one of the most basic and simple questions that comes to my mind is this— how do we know that the events in Corieta's documentary occurred in the chronology in which they are presented to us? What if Corieta is engaging in the creative intervention through montage in order to stimulate specific emotions and certain ideas in us, but in ways that are not necessarily in the strictest sense truthful, accurate, or authentic? What if the filmmaker is deceiving and manipulating us in order to tell what is, in his vision, a superior story? One of the most basic things you learn if you've ever taken a film studies class or gone to film school is the theory of montage. The word montage in French simply refers to the technique of film or video editing, which is to say taking discrete shots which are taken at different times, sometimes in drastically different places and under drastically different circumstances, and then arranging them into a sequence that creates the illusion of spatial and temporal continuity between them. In terms of the popular vernacular, montage, or rather a montage, is typically understood to refer to a specific type of sequence in a film that is intended to present a lot of visual or narrative information in an accelerated manner that implies a longer passage of time, typically scored with some high-energy music. But for our purposes, we are concerned with a more academic theory of montage, leaning heavily upon the influence of the Soviet filmmaker and theorist Sergei Eisenstein. 
which is concerned with how the particular juxtaposition of discrete shots results in a unique symbolic resonance and emotional response in the spectator. For a concise explanation of this theory, let's just take an excerpt from this 1964 CBC interview with the director Alfred Hitchcock. What one might call pure cinematics, the assembly of of film and how it can be changed to create a different idea. Now we have a close up. Let me show what he sees. Let's assume he saw a woman holding a baby in her arms. Now we cut back to his reaction to what he sees and he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. Is sympathetic. Now, let's take the middle piece of film away, the woman with the child, but leave his two pieces of film as they were. Now we'll put in uh, a piece of film of a girl in a bikini. He looks, girl in a bikini, he smiles. What is he now? The dirty old man. He's no longer the benign gentleman who loves babies. That's the difference. That's what film can do for you. Now, that's about as great an explanation of the theory of montage as you're ever going to get. So, thanks, Alfred, you untoward pervert. But we can also expand our understanding of the emotional and symbolic significance of montage so that we're not just talking about the juxtaposition of discrete shots, but rather the juxtaposition of longer scenes and sequences themselves in order to create a narrative that does not merely depict events and create the illusion of their spatial and temporal continuity, but also guides, or rather, manipulates our emotional understanding of the story, our understanding of the narrative. In the case of Without Memory, we can begin to first ask basic questions about whether or not Corey Ada's editing of this documentary creates a temporal illusion in the sense of the scenes we watch having actually taken place and been recorded in the chronology that they appear in the documentary. Let's just assume we can take for granted, for instance, that Hiroshi Sakine has been volunteering at the disabled people's home for about half a year. It is very much possible that Far from the excerpt from Hiroshi's diary being the last thing in the sequence that Koreeda shot, that he and his film crew actually took advantage of the availability of the journal at some intervening point between Hiroshi going to the disabled people's home to when we see him do it, and then the next week when we see him being apprehensive about going back. It's also very much possible that this shot was actually the first thing that was recorded. I would also put it to my viewer that it is possible that the scene in which we see Hiroshi being apprehensive about returning to the home actually took place before the sequence that we are shown of Hiroshi going to the home, and that Kori Eda exchanged the chronology of these scenes in an act of creative intervention, which, again, just to refrain the reframe the larger point about the relationship between creative intervention and material restrictions might have simply been a matter of the happy coincidence of what it took to tell the best story, while at the same time overcoming the material limitations of when and where and how much resources were available to Corieta and his production team in order to make the documentary. Now, of course, neither you nor I knows that any of these possibilities of the chronology of these shots or scenes are the case, and I have no reason to suspect that Corey Ada has undertaken any creative interventions aside from simply being around to shoot these materials and then stitch them together in the manner in which they occurred. But the point is precisely that, while we have no reason to suspect Corey Ada, we also don't no. 
and that a crucial part of developing even a basic media literacy is that we become comfortable with this tension created between what we are presented with in a discrete piece of media and what we don't know about how it was actually prepared for us. This is not just paranoia, but a genuine ethical and artistic concern. Corieta could very well be engaging in an act of creative intervention and deception in order to tell this story in a very specific way that attempts to invoke very specific emotional responses. As it exists in Without Memory, I would argue that the narrative created by Koreeda's montage starts us off in a position of curiosity and uncertainty about how Hiroshi, considering his disability, will fare in this constantly new environment for him. And then it carries us through to a period of optimism as we vicariously share in Hiroshi's contentment and fulfillment at the home, only for Koreeda to return us to a space of profound anxiety and apprehension as we come to terms with the fact that our understanding of whatever contentment or fulfillment Hiroshi might have had is largely being imposed upon him from the outside, that it is something that he can't internalize in the same way as we do, because he literally can't remember what happened or what he did. Even as we are struck by the poetry of Hiroshi's emotional memory, realizing that his experiences at the disabled people's home are leaving lingering emotional effects even absent a coherent episodic memory, we are nonetheless consumed with the melancholy that, not unlike Hiroshi's family and friends, we may only be enamoring ourselves with a very convenient fantasy, one that allows us to avoid staying too long with the tragic implications of Hiroshi's condition. It is very much possible that, arranged in a different way, this sequence could have drastically different emotional resonances. For instance, if Koreeda were to foreground Hiroshi's apprehension and ambivalence about going to the home, and then showed us him successfully finding contentment and fulfillment, this would altogether be a much more optimistic, if more naive, sequence. It is also very much possible that this is actually, strictly speaking, more truthful and accurate to the chronology in which these events that Corriata recorded actually occurred. But it is also possible that, via unique creative intervention, calculated to deceive and manipulate the spectator, Corriata is actually getting to a truth that exists beyond the purely factual, that breaks through a version of Hiroshi's life that we might prefer to believe in order to artistically reveal a truth that forces us to confront the profound humanitarian demands of participating and arranging a society that is serious about helping people like Hiroshi and their families to lead dignified lives. One could argue that such a creative intervention on Corieda's part would be highly unethical, especially as it concerns the representation of Hiroshi himself. There's already a heavy ethical concern hanging over the entire production of Without Memory, just as it hangs over any film or TV production, whether fiction or documentary, that relies upon the participation of individuals with severe mental impairments. How can a man like Hiroshi, who cannot even remember from day to day why Koreeda and his film crew are intervening in his life, how can he as an individual be said to have meaningfully consented to such intervention? One could argue, with this sequence in particular, if they were to prove that Koreeda engaged in creative deception and manipulation, that the film fundamentally presents a condescending and offensive reduction of Hiroshi's personhood to a constant tragic nightmare, and all ultimately in the name of Koreeda's artistic aggrandizement and the monetary gain of the production company when the final product is sold to television. It's possible to argue these things, but it's also, I think, just as legitimate to argue that this case study of a single sequence in Without Memory compels us to confront the extent to which that there are some cases in which manipulation and deception in an artistic context can be, to a certain extent, ethical. 
that it is not only possible, but in fact necessary to creatively intervene in the presentation of facts, or rather, a notion of factuality, in such a way that is not strictly truthful, accurate, or authentic, precisely because, ironically, it facilitates the understanding of, for lack of a better way of putting it, a higher truth about a subject. Now, again, this is just me using without memory as a speculative case study. My objective is primarily to promote media literacy as both a matter of the appreciation of the popular arts and a more active and engaged quality of ethics. My overarching hope is that by watching this video essay and by potentially seeking out without memory for yourselves, you, my audience, will come away with a greater degree of both self-confidence and comfort in being able to sit with that tension or cognitive dissonance that comes from watching a piece of media, finding oneself manipulated by its endemic quality to feel or believe something, while all the while not being able to have any certainty that what you are coming to feel or believe are, in the strictest sense, truthful, accurate, or authentic. We could all drive ourselves crazy by obsessing over what we know and don't know, which is why it's essential that we maintain a sense of critical distance that both makes us more inquisitive with a conscious ethical motivation at its backing, but also provides us with a more productive sense of structure and security, even when it comes to experiencing and accepting that cognitive dissonance between the known, or the felt, and the unknown. Because barring some spontaneous bit of comprehensive investigation into the production of one TV edutainment documentary from the mid-90s, you will never be able to really know how truthful, accurate, or authentic without memory is if you see it. You will never be able to know if, or to what extent, Hirokazu Koreeda's creative interventions have manipulated your understanding of the documentary's subject. Indeed, you could say the very same thing about this video essay. I mean, come on, have you even seen Without Memory? I'm assuming the majority of you haven't. It's not like it's a particularly well-known or highly regarded documentary, even considering the director who made it and his later career. I myself only really happened upon it rather accidentally because I was interested in seeing Broker. I wanted to watch more of Corieta's films, and by doing some Googling, I found out that Without Memory was not commercially available for me, but that an English-language edit narrated by James Nolan had been uploaded to a Facebook account called In the Mood for Cinema in 2021, and who knows how long it'll survive on that platform. Really, if anything I've said in the last 40 minutes or so has made any meaningful impact on you, you'll already be feeling a certain level of tension and cognitive dissonance, except it won't be between yourself and a movie you haven't seen. It'll be between you and this video essay, this thing that, again, endemically, only exists due to a creative intervention and, just as endemically, is host to all sorts of basic, simple questions that you as an audience should ask yourselves about what you don't know, not just what it seems like I know because of the various persuasive and inherently manipulative techniques I have used to make this essay. Because I'm going to level with whoever's watching out there. If you've made it this far and you've found my presentation of Without Memory convincing and persuasive, I won't say that you've been entirely deceived. But look, I know what point I wanted to make with this video essay, and I already knew, or I felt, that without memory would make a great case study for getting my point across. But once I realized that without memory is not only a documentary that very few people would have seen, but that many of them who might be my audience would have no possibility of seeing it, I really started to meditate on the extent to which the power and the privilege really was all in my hands to inform you, my audience, about the film in pursuit of the point I was trying to make about creative interventions and documentary ethics. And once I really realized that, halfway through writing the script for this essay, 
I couldn't help but having a feeling that maybe I could take for granted that by talking in a certain way, by writing in a certain way, by relying on the ignorance of my audience, that I could make myself persuasive in my point with relatively little input that my audience would themselves take for granted, almost intuitively, that what they are watching was truthful, accurate, and authentic in its presentation of without memory and what certain sequences contained. And once I realized that, I asked myself, is it possible that I could make my point even stronger by making an even more radical creative intervention? Which is to say, could I be more persuasive in my conviction about some truth by deliberately deceiving and manipulating you as my audience? Well, whoever it is out there making up that audience, if anyone at all, I just want you to know that you've been had. You've been taken. You've been hoodwinked and bamboozled by me. Because in order to really drive home my point about creative intervention and documentary ethics, I deliberately used my own editing of this video to lie to you. The sequence that I just analyzed in Without Memory in order to illustrate my point about montage theory did not actually occur in the order as I presented it. In the actual documentary, Corieta does in fact show what I outlined only as a possible variation on events, which is that the scene of Hiroshi's apprehension of going to the disabled people's home occurs before the depiction of his going there. Not only that, the excerpt from his diary in which his emotional memory calls up the QQQ of the song he sings is actually the first thing that Corieta uses to start off that particular sequence. There is a journal excerpt that concludes the sequence, but far from a melancholy one, it is one in which Hiroshi expresses that by volunteering at the disabled people's home, even if he doesn't remember ever going there or his relationships with the people, he takes some comfort in the idea that his life still has purpose and value beyond his dependency. We all support each other. Even in my reduced condition, I'm not just a burden. I can help bring people together. So not only is the sequence as it occurs in the actual documentary somewhat more optimistic in its progression, Corieta's decision to start the sequence with the journal excerpt about the song is really quite clever. In a completely different type of creative intervention, he empowers the narrative, storytelling potential of his documentary by providing the spectator with something strange and obscure and even haunting, before creating a payoff later once we reveal, without explicitly commenting on it, what it was that her Hiroshi was remembering. The possibilities of this type of creative intervention are quite nuanced, and in some ways all the more adhere to the very style of Corieta's documentary to complement its subject. Because even if we have episodic memory and Hiroshi does not, neither we nor he are beings who subsist on factuality alone. Our own memories are themselves in large part emotional impressions. We are far more likely to internalize the information that Corieta presents to us in his documentary, much of which can at first appear quite specialized and complicated, if the filmmaker uses the various techniques at his disposal to involve us in an emotional narrative and an identification with Hiroshi as a protagonist. We ourselves, like Hiroshi, are more likely to not only learn something, but to retain it if we feel emotions, both positive and negative, that reinforce the value of that information. Now, everything I had to say about creative intervention and documentary ethics still stands. Neither you nor I really knows what order these, shall we say, episodic materials collected by Corieta actually took place in or were recorded. Neither you nor I knows, really, what is the extent of Corieta's creative intervention in order to weave a particular type of narrative which, not unlike Hiroshi's own consciousness, 
resonates not based on the comprehensive or coherent understanding of particular events, but based on the feelings they inspire. But at the same time, in either case, a legitimate argument can be made that the manipulation and intervention endemic to Coriata's craft speaks to its own kind of truth that might not be possible to express otherwise, especially if we adhere only to the strictest, most Puritan notion of factuality. Not to toot my own horn, but if you're really starting to distrust me at this moment, I'll include a link to the documentary below, and you can watch it at your own discretion. And then you can decide for yourself. Is, without memory, besides whether or not it's a good documentary, is it a solid vehicle for exploring the questions I've raised? If not, then, well, maybe you can also tell me if this video essay really achieves what I set out to do. Whether, in effect, I have justified my creative intervention and manipulation by promoting the contemplation of truths that could not have been explored or not as effectively otherwise. I'd like to thank you for sticking with this, if you stuck with it, and hey, if you enjoyed it, and you'd like to see more from me, please do me the indulgence of subscribing to the channel, maybe even throwing some topics my way. I'm always open to suggestions as far as movies to explore and to critique. At the very least, if you did like this, please share it and recommend it to others. I would really like to test my creative intervention on as many people as possible. To wit, if you do feel inclined to share it, please, for the love of God, don't give away the twist. At least do me the solid of fondly deceiving a couple more people.